Hello and welcome to the Mr. Brown podcast, where I reflect on my journey as an early career teacher with a special focus on mental health. I am your host, James Brown. So ends my first week as a qualified teacher. An early career teacher, yes, but a qualified teacher nonetheless. And I say my first week, but the first two days of that week, Monday, Tuesday, were inset days. I still don't know what inset stands for. I've found so far in education that there seem to be loads of acronyms floating around that once stood for something, but don't seem to stand for anything anymore, or at least very few people can remember what they stand for. I'm not saying inset is one of those. You probably know what it means. I'm yet to find out. All I know is that on Monday and Tuesday, we had staff training days. The staff were in, but the students weren't. The students returned on Wednesday. They spent the first part of the day with their tutors, and then lessons resumed from period three onwards. So what I thought I'd do in this episode is talk about some questions that arose for me during those first two staff training days, and then talk about some other things that came up once I was back to teaching. So first, some questions that arose for me during those first two staff training days. I don't know the answers to these questions, but still they got my, they got my brain ticking over. They interested me. So I'm going to throw them out there in case they may interest you too. And if you think you may have an answer, then please let me know. So in the first presentation on Monday, the head teacher said that numbers don't matter. Destinations do. So when he says numbers, he means that results don't really matter. Results being grades. And how many students achieved each grade. For him, that's not what matters. What matters is student destinations, what do they do after school? How has our school put students in the strongest possible position to have a brighter future? I see where he's coming from, but what if we take this to the extreme? So suppose that there was a school where all students either failed their exams or got very low grades. But also, each and every one of those students, after school, went on to do something that they really wanted to do, that made a difference in the world, and that led to them having flourishing lives. So, despite not getting any good grades, the school still somehow prepared them to lead good lives. Now, I'm not entirely sure what would happen to a school where all the students fail their exams, like this school that we're imagining. Perhaps you could tell me, but I can't imagine it would be good. I'd have thought, and please correct me here if I'm wrong, that such a school would be placed in some sort of special measures, and changes would have to be made, and ultimately, the school would no longer be able to operate as it had been operating. So I think this thought experiment shows that While destinations do matter, schools still have to play the game. While destinations may be my school's top priority, and many other schools' top priority, if the students, at the same time, aren't getting good enough grades to stave off any sort of outside intervention, then the school can't operate. But I think this is an issue with our system, because the school I described in the thought experiment, where each and every one of the students leaves, and as a result of being in that school, goes on to lead a flourishing life, must, for that reason, be an exceptional school, an amazing school, a perfect school. Yet within our system, if those students weren't getting the grades, if the school didn't have the required numbers, then they wouldn't be able to continue doing what they were doing. 
And so perhaps the system that we currently have is valuing the wrong sorts of things. But of course, usually, good grades do tend to lead to more life opportunities. And the more opportunities a student has, I guess the more likely it is that they will find a path that leads to a good life. And again, perhaps that's an issue. Perhaps student grades shouldn't determine the likelihood that that student will lead a good life. Before I meander any further, I'm going to draw this first question to a close. But I thought it was interesting. Let me know if you have any thoughts. Okay, the second question. Our head teacher told us a story about a student who left school with good grades, went to their university of choice, but they didn't last very long at university. They dropped out after a year or so. And our head teacher suggested that what we need to do to ensure that this sort of thing doesn't happen is to create independent learners. The assumption being here that independent learners are more likely to survive at uni. And I would like to challenge this assumption. On my PGCE course last year, more maths teachers dropped out than any other teachers. And apparently that's a, a general trend. Maths teachers, more than any other teachers, drop out of their initial teacher training. Why is that? Well, there have been studies done into why that is. And the studies suggest that one of the main reasons is that when studying maths at university, so this is before teacher training, when studying maths at university, it's a relatively individual undertaking. You work on your own. Now, I studied maths at university, and I can confirm this from my own experience. We had one small group project in, I think, third year. It didn't last more than a week, and I can hardly remember what we did. The rest of the time at university was spent studying alone. So as a math student at university, you come to believe, I think, that success is a matter of individual effort. And of course it is, but training to become a maths teacher is arguably much harder than just studying the subject of maths at university. And the reason so many maths teachers drop out is that they don't ask for help. Well, that's what this study suggested they are less likely to turn to colleagues and mentors and ask for help. And so they're more likely to struggle, and they're more likely, therefore, to drop out. So in a very real sense, the problem is that they are too independent. And teaching and learning how to teach is not really something that you can do on your own. And I think the same goes for uni in general. If we want to create students who flourish at university, we should be less concerned with creating independent learners and more concerned with creating learners who feel comfortable reaching out and asking for help. What do you think about that one? Okay, three more questions. Oh, by the way, I should say, let's say, for example, that you're finding this part of the podcast a bit dull, but otherwise you enjoy the podcast. If that's you then please don't hesitate to use the chapter markers, okay? I create chapters for all of my podcasts. I know you can use them in iTunes. I think you can use them in Spotify. Hopefully you can use them. If you go into the show notes, you should be able to see the chapters that I've created for this episode and for every episode. So by all means, skip ahead. But fingers crossed that isn't you and, um, and you don't mind joining me for these more abstract reflections. Okay, just how many more questions did I say? I said three more questions. Equality versus equity. This seems to come up regularly. And the image that we're always shown is one of three people decreasing heights. So a tall person, medium height person, and a short person. And there's a fence. And they're trying to see over the fence to 
watch. I think it might be a baseball game. I don't know, but they're, they're each trying to see over the fence to, to watch something. In the first picture, the picture that represents equality, they are each stood on one box. The tall person can see fine. The medium height person, I think, can just about see over with the help of one box. Yet the shortest person is still looking just at the fence. They're nowhere near being able to see over the fence. That's equality. The second picture, which represents equity, the tall person doesn't have a box at all because they could see over the fence without the assistance of a box. The medium height person has one box, which enables them to see over the, over the fence just fine. And then the shortest person has got two of the boxes. They're stood on two of the boxes and then they can see over the fence too. So there are still three boxes being used, but they've been redistributed according to the needs of the individuals. And now all three of them can, can watch the baseball game. There is a third picture called Liberation, where there's no fence at all, but I don't really know what that represents, so let's just stick with the first two. It's a nice illustration of equality and equity. But I'd like to think about those two concepts in the context of teacher attention. So let's imagine that those boxes represent a teacher's attention. And a teacher needs to decide in the classroom how and where to direct their attention, which students are going to get more of their attention and which students are going to get less of their attention. According to the equity approach, it's the students who are struggling who should get more teacher attention to bring them up to the same sort of level as everyone else. But what I find happens in the classroom is that I do indeed direct more of my attention to the students who are struggling to try and bring them up. But then the highest attainers also demand my attention because often they finish the work quickly and I need to give them some extra work, some extension or stretch exercises. And so what happens in my classroom anyway it seems to be the lowest and the highest attainers that get most of my attention. And it's the students in the middle who perhaps end up losing out. And so I guess this is a general question about how to resolve this tension. So a teacher only has a finite amount of attention that they can distribute in any given lesson. What's the best way to distribute it? Okay, next question. Okay, so I want to talk about metacognition and cognitive overload. So metacognition is quite a big deal. It refers to thinking about thinking. So a student is learning metacognitively if, as they're learning, they're thinking about their learning. They're reflecting on how it's going, what obstacles and barriers they're facing, how they might overcome those barriers. In general, they're surveying their own thoughts. They're not just thinking, they're also thinking about thinking. Now, students who are metacognitive in this way, who self-regulate in this way, typically make an additional seven months of progress. This is coming from the Education Endowment Foundation's website. And this finding is based on pretty strong evidence. Okay, so metacognition is a big deal. We want our learners to be metacognitive. But as I just said, metacognition involves thinking about thinking. So you're not just thinking about what you're doing. You're not just thinking about solving this maths problem, say. You're also thinking about thinking about solving this maths problem. So instead of thinking about one thing, you're trying to think about two things. Now, this seems like a recipe for cognitive overload. Cognitive overload happens when you're trying to hold too many things in working memory at once. Your attention is being split too many different ways. And you end up not being able to think about anything properly. And therefore learn very little. So what's the quote? Learning is the residue of thought. 
to learn something, you need to think about it. But if you're trying to think about too many things at once, then you're not really properly thinking about any of them. You're like butter spread over too much bread. And so you're going to struggle to learn anything. So again, there seems to be a tension here between metacognition, the idea that we shouldn't only think, but also think about thinking, and cognitive overload, where if you think about too many things at once, you'll never end up learning anything. So what do you think? Do you think there is a real tension there? And if so, how might it be resolved? Okay, last thought. The last thought regarding the teacher training. We were talking about access arrangements. For example, having extra time in exams, or using a computer in your exams, or perhaps having a scribe. Arrangements that schools make to help students access those assessments and other things. Sometimes students with ASD, so students who are autistic, basically, sometimes they have certain access arrangements. Perhaps they're allowed to sit their exams in a separate room, something like that. But then the teacher who was leading this session on access arrangements mentioned that one student who has ASD, functions at a very high level as a genius. I think he referred to him as the smartest child he'd ever met. And so he doesn't need any access arrangements. And so he doesn't get any. And I thought this was interesting because it seems to suggest that it's not the special educational need that matters here. So this student has ASD, which is a special educational need yet he does really well with his learning. So he doesn't need any access arrangements. And so that suggests that whether a student has access arrangements isn't determined by whether they have a special educational need, but rather by how well they're doing. Now, there are loads of students who don't have a special educational need and who are also doing pretty badly. Are they allowed access arrangements? And so I should say here that this was my first ever session on access arrangements. And I went into it under the assumption that it was students with special educational needs who have access arrangements. But I left the session not being so sure. So is it just students who need access arrangements who are granted access arrangements? I don't know what the deal is. I'll be sure to follow it up with someone at my school. But in the meantime, if you know or have any thoughts, again, please let me know. OK, so those were those were some of the thoughts and questions that I had during those first two days of teacher training. But the students returned on Wednesday. So let's talk about that now. On that first Wednesday, it made my day. But on reflection, it also made me a bit sad. And I'll explain why. So on that first day, on that Wednesday, two of my students from last year, they were year seven last year, now they're year eight, they came to see me at lunchtime. I was in the staff room. I heard this voice at the door saying, is Mr. Brown there? I got up to see who it was. And they'd just come to say hi, to see how I was, to ask me how my summer had been to talk about who I was teaching this year, to ask me about their new teacher. And we just generally had a really nice conversation. One of them asked me for a fist bump, which he'd remembered from last year. Apparently it meant a lot to him. There was just one or two occasions where I was happy with his work and I gave him a fist bump. And it made my day. But later I thought about it. And these two students were two of my most troublesome students last year the majority of my interactions with them would have been negative. They'd have been misbehaving and I would be telling them off or trying to get them to behave. So I would say that more of my interactions with those students were negative than positive. More often I was telling them off for poor behaviour than praising them for good behaviour. And I think that that's perhaps something that I have to work on as a teacher when it comes to my behaviour management strategy. It is something I'm working on. 
But anyway, that's just the way it was. Can't change it now. So most of my interactions with them were negative, And yet they still cared enough to come and see me on the first day of school, to see how I was, to have a nice chat. Now, my school operates in a highly challenging social context. It's an inner city school. A lot of the kids have rough backgrounds. I don't know a great deal about these two students' backgrounds, but still it made me think that a lot of my interactions with them had been negative, yet they still came to the conclusion that I really cared about them. Cared enough that they would then want to come and see me and have a chat. And I do indeed care about them a lot. And so I didn't know whether that showed us something about their background. I mean, I'm not making any assumptions here, but it just occurred to me that perhaps they've grown up in a setting where those they look up to aren't always that nice to them. I mean, perhaps I'm thinking too much about this. Maybe I just shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth and just be grateful that we had that nice chat on that Wednesday afternoon. Okay, for the first time this week, I taught a top set. I didn't teach a top set throughout my training year. Well, right towards the end of the year, I took over a top set. But at that point, we were only doing revision for the for the end of year spiral assessment. But now I have a top set year nine and they are the most perfectly behaved class I've ever had. Now, if you told me beforehand that I was going to have a perfectly behaved class, I'd have thought fantastic. One less thing to worry about. Yet. When I was there. In front of them. And the classroom was so silent that you could hear a pin drop. And indeed, the only thing you could hear was my voice. I felt this real pang of self-consciousness. I was suddenly aware that these kids are really listening to me. I need to make sure that what I'm telling them is good. And so, yes, I suddenly became self-conscious. And if I, as the teacher, have ever needed a bit more time to think about what it is I'm teaching... In most of my previous classes, I could usually turn around from the board and there'd be someone who wasn't paying attention and I could say, so-and-so, are you paying attention? So I could address a behaviour issue whilst giving myself a bit more room to think about what it was I was teaching, about how I wanted to phrase something, perhaps. No such luck here. I've got to be on it as a teacher from start to finish. There's nowhere to hide. All eyes are on me. And these are very clever students. So yes, it's a new experience for me. And they are a fantastic class. I'm so happy I've got them. So on the one hand, I feel self-conscious. I feel like I've got to step my game up. But on the other hand, I've got all these wonderful ideas about all these great things I want to do with them. So I'm really grateful. But yes, at the same time, it's definitely a new challenge for me. And I'll just talk about my year sevens, my new year sevens. And then I'll finish by talking about my mental health. So so my year sevens are wonderful. I should start by saying that. And they're so small. So when I first came to my school as a trainee, it was in January. And so the year sevens then had already had one term at school, and I think they do a lot of growing up in that term. But this year, I've met my year sevens in September, and they're just tiny little dots. Children. And one thing we do with the year sevens when they first arrive, it's horrible really, but we make them sit a baseline test. It's a bit like their SATs. It's just so we can assess whether they've been put into the right sets based on their SATs results. And so there's often a little bit of movement between sets after we've done this baseline test. And 
they had half an hour to do this first baseline test. And about 15 minutes in, one lad puts his hand up. I go over to him and he says, Um, sir, the... No, Mr. Brown. I've noticed that the year sevens tend to call me Mr. Brown and the older students tend to call me sir. So, Mr. Brown, um, the, the question box on question 19 is bigger than all the other question boxes. And sure enough, he was right. On the test paper, the space where you wrote your answer for question 19 was bigger, maybe double the size of the rest of the answer boxes. And he seemed worried about this. And I was a bit bemused, because of course it doesn't matter at all. But not only did he seem worried, after he'd pointed this out to me, clearly the rest of the class had been listening, and I could hear them flicking to page 19, and there were a few audible gasps among these year sevens. They were legitimately concerned by the fact that the answer box for question 19 was bigger than the rest. But I managed to preempt any sort of general panic, so I addressed the issue to the whole class. I told them that no, it's not significant at all, don't worry about it, just put your answer in the box as you would do with any other question, nothing to worry about. And that seemed to placate them, they settled down a little bit. I'm glad it didn't erupt into a riot. But then only a moment or two later, a girl puts her hand up and says, So, Mr. Brown, should we just pretend that it doesn't exist? <laughs> um, and I said, yes, perfect solution, pretend that it doesn't exist. And I just thought it was a wonderful moment. These kids really care about uniformity and just the sort of things that that worry a year seven compared to the sorts of things that worry an older student. thought it was wonderful. If only our worries could remain so insignificant, that would be great. Okay, so my mental health. Haven't had any issues. I've been tired, I've been stressed, but I haven't had any mental health problems whatsoever. I even haven't exercised for a while. So last year during my PGCE, one of my guards against mental health issues was to exercise regularly. I haven't exercised in a while. I do some general stretching every so often, but when it comes to lifting weights or going for a run, it's been a long time. But even so, my mental health has been good. And if I had to put it down to something, I'd say it's because I have a job to do, and it's a very important job, and it's a job I care about. and. There is one difference when compared to last year. So when I was training, of course, I was still teaching. A very important job, and one which I cared about from the beginning. But this year, a major difference is I have my own classes. I have more control. I have a greater sense of agency. And if you've listened to previous episodes, you'll know that a sense of agency is one of the three innate psychological needs that need to be satisfied if we're to be mentally healthy and properly motivated. The other two are a sense of competence. You need to feel like you're capable of doing what it is you're trying to do. And the third is a sense of belonging. So I think throughout my teaching journey so far, I had those I kind of always believed that I could do this. I believed that it was within my capability to become a teacher, a good teacher. Not saying I'm there yet. I'm thinking long term. That belief in myself was there. And especially since coming to my current school, I have a real sense of belonging. My department are wonderful. You know, for the first time in a long time, I feel that I'm actually making friends. I feel like I haven't made friends maybe since university. And for a long time, I've just kind of relied on the friends that I made during previous chapters of my life. And I haven't made any new friends, but now I feel like I'm making new friends. So yes, I always had that sense of competence and a sense of belonging.
that now this year, now that I have my own classes, I also have that sense of agency, that sense of control. And I feel good. I feel properly motivated and mentally healthy. I hope you feel exactly the same. This has been a long episode today. If you've gotten this far, congratulations. And given the length of this episode, it will probably take three to four hours to produce. It takes an hour or so to record, this one would. And then a couple of hours to tidy up and publish. And if you think that that work is worth the price of a coffee once a month, then please consider becoming a patron, which you can do on my Patreon page, which will be linked, as always, in the show notes. I hope you've had a good week, and I hope your week to come is good also. I may speak to you next week. I may not. But I will definitely speak to you again in two weeks' time. If you enjoyed this episode, please spread the word in person and on social media. You can follow me on Twitter at MrBrownPod or email MrBrownPod at gmail.com. Please subscribe, rate and review in your directory of choice. Please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash MrBrownPod and helping me cover the cost of producing the podcast. Thank you and talk again soon.